Hello dear viewers, it's the 2nd of December and that means it's time to review It Takes You Away. Now speaking of things being taken away, you may notice a uh, slight difference <laughs> in the backdrop today. So my lovely backdrop of uh, TARDIS Roundels, which was designed by Clayton Hickman, you can find his Redbubble store, I've linked it in the description, uh, unfortunately won't be seen today because the frame that holds it up has got jammed. Yeah, that screw is stuck in there, I'm gonna need some pliers. So yeah, we have uh, one of my fiancé's paintings instead, and the good news is I really, I really like that one anyway. So, moving on. It Takes You Away is directed by Jamie Childs, who has previously directed Demons of the Punjab and The Woman Who Fell to Earth, and will also be directing The Battle of Ranskor Ab Kolos next week. And look, I still love his work as a director, he does a wonderful job here. The script by Ed Heim is fantastic. This is one of the main standout episodes of the series for me. It is up there with Rosa. I love the way the story twists and turns. I'm so glad that Ed Heim, spoiler alert, is back on series 12, writing at least one episode. I think with the description they've given, he can only be writing one episode, but I'm super glad that he, Pete McTighe, and Vinay Patel are all coming back. Joy Wilkinson, I'm really hoping, gets another crack in the future as well. I would love to see another script from Mallory Blackman too. All of the guest writers, I've really enjoyed their work this series. Straight up, one of the things I love about It Takes You Away so much is that... Almost the entire 50 minutes is an exercise in misdirection. We're constantly told the story is about one thing, and then that idea, it doesn't get abandoned, but we're told, no, that's not what the story's about, it's about this now. So at first it is about a teenage girl called Hannah, who is alone in a cottage in rural Norway. Her father has gone missing, and there's a monster outside. But then we discover there's actually a portal in her house to an anti-zone, which is full of things called flesh moths and a strange character called Ribbons of the Seven Stomachs. So, did her dad go there? No. We move on again. He has gone to a mirror universe, and I love the touch that the mirror universe is accessed through a mirror, and everything in it is mirrored. <laughs> you know, all the, all the patterns, any writing is mirrored. And he's there because his wife is still alive. And we've seen in Doctor Who before parallel worlds where people who've died in the main world are still alive there. So it could be about that. But no, it's about this sentient universe who is using dead loved ones in order to entice people. But it's not an evil takeover plot, so it changes again to the universe just wants company. And all of these ideas on their own are great, and I think any of them could have been a 50 minute episode on their own, but you put them all together and I think you end up with something really magical. Watching this the second time this week, at first with the anti-zone stuff I was thinking, why is this here? It's here to pad out 10 minutes, and I don't like that, I don't like padding, but it's actually there to misdirect you. Over on Flight Through Entirety, Richard always says Doctor Who is at its best when it's doing other things, and one of the things it's doing with the Anti-Zone is Stranger Things. We're in the Upside Down. The aesthetic is very similar. Now there's no Demigorgon, there's Ribbons of the Seven Stomachs instead, and what a wonderful turn by Kevin Eldon. Yeah, if you didn't already know, it's Kevin Eldon under all that makeup, the British comic, and most of the stuff I've seen him in He's playing his usual sort of offbeat, uptight character. And it's a joy to see him do something different here. And I knew before this episode first went out that Kevin Eldon was going to be in it. And I was really looking forward to that. And then during the episode, got to about the halfway mark, and I thought, when's Kevin Eldon going to turn up? By that point, Kevin Eldon's already dead, and I think that's just a real testament to his performance. In terms of writing Ribbons of the Seven Stomachs, he's given a very alien thought process. Possibly because he's got seven stomachs, everything he considers relates to food. Information is delicious. You know, it's not enticing or interesting, it's delicious. So when he says things to the Doctor, like your brain must be delicious. I don't think he's actually talking about eating the doctor's brain. 
I think he's saying, you are such an interesting person. To know more of your knowledge would be delicious. Now, of course, he's a shifty character, and he threatens them all, and that leads to his downfall. But he's an interesting character while he's there. I'm a bit disappointed that I don't think we ever really find out what he's doing in the anti-zone. He does say it's not his anti-zone, but we also don't find out how he got there. He doesn't seem to be from the Solitrax universe, and he doesn't seem to possibly be from our universe, and certainly not Norway in 2018, but <laughs> however he got there, I'm very, very glad he's there. Even before that, though, I love how the Doctor and her friends spring into action as soon as they feel there is something wrong. They try to come up with rational explanations for it, they don't just burst into the house and demand explanations, they treat it like they're walking into a situation where they don't know what is happening. They act like normal people, and I love that when Ryan and Graham find Hannah, for a moment, Ryan is more scared of her <laughs> than she is of him. Something that Doctor Who excels in in the modern age is its treatment of children characters and giving them voice and appropriate scripting so that they actually sound like children. We have had some where that hasn't really been the case. Looking at you, Angie and Artie. But for the most part, modern Doctor Who is very good on that. And I love that Hannah is played by an actress, Eleanor Warwork, who is herself blind. Very often in any given production, if a character is blind, they will be played by a sighted actor. But instead, we have a performance by a blind actor, which means we get the shorthand before the Doctor and her friends realise that Hannah is blind. None of the regular characters patronise her. With one exception. The Doctor, of course, writes that message on the wall saying that Ryan is to presume that Hannah's father, Eric, is dead and must protect her at all costs, including protecting her from that information. And the Doctor does that in a way that Hannah can't know what that message says. And it's that old chestnut that Colin Baker had about the character, which is the Doctor does what is right, and that may not necessarily be nice or beautiful. We may question the Doctor keeping that information from Hannah, but in this situation, the Doctor's choices are, tell Hannah that these are my suspicions, and if I'm wrong, I traumatise this young woman even more than she already is, or keep this information from her until I know, but still, I have to tell Ryan in order for him to be aware of what I think is happening in this situation. And you know what, it's uncomfortable, but you can entirely understand the Doctor's motivations here. And again, it gives Hannah a chance to show her intelligence in figuring out that didn't sound like a map, that sounded like a message, I know what things sound like. And she knocks out Ryan, takes the key, and goes through into the mirror universe. I love the tension between her and Ryan, because Ryan's immediate idea is that Dad has just scarpered, and it's not explicitly stated in the plot, it doesn't have to be, but that comes from the fact that that is what happened to Ryan. So that is naturally the first place his mind is going to go to, especially because he knows that Trina, Hannah's mum, has passed away, just like his own mum. He's seeing the parallels, and he can't help but put his own experience into the situation. It's another story that I think utilises all four regulars really well. You know, Yaz and Graham go through to the Anti-Zone and the parallel world with the Doctor, and Yaz gets some really spiky moments there, like when they're challenging Eric for leaving Hannah behind. And Eric's defence is, I created the monster, if you like, so she would stay indoors. But what about the bear traps? Well, there's bears, you know. So, Eric is protecting Hana the best way he can, while he's also pursuing this phantom of his wife. And I remember around the time this episode went out is when I put up my Five Bottom Stories video, which of course didn't include any Jodie Whittaker. One, because she hadn't been broadcast when I recorded it, but two, also, there's no stories this season that I would put in my bottom five, or even my bottom ten. But someone then came in and commented underneath that I should put It Takes You Away in there because it's anti-single father. And I really don't think that's the case here. 
Eric is negligent of his daughter's needs, but it's because of his grief. And this story offers a really interesting discussion and ideas about grief and how it makes you do strange things. Because we find out that after Trina died, Eric took Hannah out to the country and they were alone. So he cut himself off from everyone except for his daughter. And then he gets a chance at getting his wife back. And by putting Graham in the same situation, I think that stops the viewer from judging Eric too harshly. It asks us, because Graham is one of our audience identification characters, it asks us what would we do in that situation. And Eric is trying to do the best thing possible by everyone. You know, he's keeping Hannah safe by keeping her indoors and creating this monster. But at the same time, he wants to try and put his family back together. And it really is a tragic story. He, he is trying to have his cake and eat it too. And what has happened to him and Hannah is horribly unfair. You know, the death of Hannah's mother, judging by her apparent age in the show, far too young. But as Graham and Ryan have been accepting through this series, sometimes unfair things happen and you have to... You have to press on. It is, of course, wonderful to see Sharon D. Clarke back as Grace. And I love Grace's own uncertainty of who she is. And I do wonder how aware Trina and Grace are that they are extensions of this thing called the Solar Tract. And if they aren't aware to start with, do they only become aware when the Solar Tract starts to turn on the people from our universe as they reject it? Another failing of this episode, then, is possibly the Doctor explaining the Solar Track to Yaz. I didn't mind it so much this time around, but last year it really jarred with me. And, you know, I can't quite put my finger on it. It's not the direction, it's not particularly the script, which presents the Solar Track as this fascinating science fiction idea. It's certainly not Jodie or Mandip's performances. I think they're both wonderful in that scene. It's just an info dump too far. With the Doctor describing that it would be disastrous if the Solar Tract touched our universe, and that's why the Anti-Zone is there, it's a protection method that our universe is putting up in order to protect itself. I would have liked Yaz, who, if you remember, in the Saranga Conundrum, asked about the Antimatter Drive, I would have liked Yaz to say, what, so it's like matter and antimatter? Perhaps my, one of my problems with this scene is that Yaz is just kind of asking, well, what's that doctor? Well, what's that doctor? Well, what's that doctor? Not really offering much on her own. And later she gets a line of, well, have you tried reversing the polarity? And it kind of comes out of nowhere. But again, if Yaz had just said, if we're in a mirror universe, reverse the settings. You know, and that way there's some logic at work. Yaz does say, is there something you haven't tried, like reversing the polarity? But that seems like a very odd phrase for Yaz to come up with by herself, you know, unless a writer who's a long-term fan was putting it in the script. But look, that is a minor, minor thing. We need to have this explanation of how the solid tract works, which leads me to the frog. I love the frog. I love how ridiculously absurd it is <laughs> to have this universe take the form of a frog. And why does it take the form of a frog? It's not even something as simple as just Grace likes frogs. As well as Grace liking frogs, remember she tells that memory of the Christmas that Ryan and Graham both got her similar frog necklaces because they don't talk to each other. And it just reminds us what the relationship between the three of them was like. Ryan didn't really accept Graham as his grandfather but was on the way to. They weren't so different. They were buying Grace the same present. And I think that probably gave Grace a bit of hope that this was going to turn out okay. And now Graham wears the frog to remind him of Grace. No wonder the Soul Attract likes the symbol of the frog. Because the frog represents this fractious togetherness that Grace and her family have. And the Solar Tract wants that togetherness. I like that the Solar Tract was not acting out of malice. It was acting out of loneliness. 
And when it realises the hurt it's causing, it does lash out, you know, it throws people across the room back into the anti-zone, but that is also an act of letting them go. It's, it's two things at once. It's angry, but it's understanding. And anyone out there who doesn't like Jodie Whittaker's Doctor, I challenge you, go back and watch the end of this episode where the Doctor says goodbye to the Solitract. That, for me, has been Jodie Whittaker's most Doctorish scene this series. Because the Doctor is sad at leaving behind everything she's ever known, but she is so fascinated with the idea of befriending this sentient universe. And when she realises she can't stay, when she realises that it will not only annihilate her, but it will annihilate the Solar Tract, she has to say, look, you have to let me go, but we will never forget one another. And of course, the Doctor is a transient character. They are always moving on. But the Doctor here makes it very clear that she doesn't just forget people. Like she says at the beginning of this series, she carries her family with her. And what does she keep calling her new friends but her family? When luring people into its universe, the Solar Tract's first acts are to give people back their loved ones, whom they've lost. And you know what, the Doctor says, look, with one person here it should be okay, but with five, I don't think this is going to work. The Solar Tract could always have intended Hannah to come through as well. And of course, when Hannah does come through, the false Trina comes to her like a mother would to a daughter. But of course, Hannah knows the difference. Hannah has adjusted to the grief better than her father has, possibly. Just like we're told that Ryan has adjusted to the grief of losing his mother and his grandmother better than his father has. And in the end, it is the real relationship, if you like, between father and daughter, which saves the father and convinces him to go back home to his prior life and presumably that will get him more support. You know, he will be around friends, he will be around family, and he still has his daughter. And in its final action, the Solar Tract saves the Doctor because it's made a new friend. The others end up being afraid of the Solar Tract, but not the Doctor. I think the Solar Tract acts in quite a Doctorish way in the end. And that's really, really lovely. As we close out the story, of course, there is an unspoken confrontation between the Doctor and Eric when I think it really hits home to Eric what he did and how what he did affected his daughter. And I think that's possibly the catalyst for them going home. And then we get that lovely, lovely moment where Ryan finally calls Graham Grandad. And... I think, in conjuring up Grace, if you like, Ryan finally understands just how loving their relationship was. And, well, I suppose if Grace can love Graham that much, then so can Ryan. And, you know what, we don't have all of that spoken between the characters. It's all done with a few words. And that's really excellent. Look, some slight storytelling niggles aside, this is one of my favourites of the season. I give it 9 out of 10. I'm really looking forward to seeing more of what Ed Heim writes next series. And if it is true that he's written for Sapphire and Steel, I am hanging out for that, I tell ya. Come back tomorrow, I'll be saying something nice about another Doctor Who story. But until then, thank you very much for watching.